Hello everybody and welcome back to another Future of the Fortress. These are the monthly Q&As that take place on the Bay 12 forums. The Bay 12 community around Dwarf Fortress gets together once a month and asks Tarn a bunch of questions. Then Tarn proceeds to answer them, usually around the first. This time he did it a couple days early, and I didn't notice until a couple days after. And at the time I was very deep in editing this video that you're currently seeing the thumbnail of on screen. So I was very busy and unable to get this done until now. As always, if you would like to take part in these conversations, you can do that by following the link in the description to the official thread itself. The first question comes in from DPH Kraken, and they ask, I'd like to ask about how the visual changes to some of the Civ creatures came about during the transition from text to graphics. Elf beards and kobold snouts. Anything in the vision or the fiction of the default setting that brought it to fruition? And Tarn's response is, Elf beards was a miscommunication. I just didn't request that they be drawn. We'll get to it at some point. Kobold snouts was a result of Mike's depiction a long time ago. The fan craving for the cute bold. Cute bolds became canon as they ever evolve from chihuahuas to kobolds to dragons to cute bolds and beyond. Another one, goblin hair, is complicated because we have some art, but it doesn't fit the existing raw hairstyles. So that just needs to be sorted out. The next question comes in from Cripurium, and they ask, are features of dwarves like strange moods and the ability to see in darkness and the ability to breathe in non-ventilated caves, etc., can those be considered magical and hence subject of the myth and magic editor? And Tarn's response is, I think the luification and then myth and magic, it's more like everything is subject to change. But for darkness and breathing, those are broader mechanical questions that would need to be addressed in the map and game code as well, since it doesn't track light or oxygen, beyond the subterranean inside and outside and the existence of flows. The next question comes in from Rhino, and they say, Have any prototypes been attempted yet for a visible day-night cycle in adventure mode? What can we expect light and time information to look like? Does it present any technical challenges? And what happens underground? And has Putnam's knowledge of shaders been explored as a possible solution for some graphical features? And Tarn quotes Putnam first, so I will read her response before reading Tarn's response. And she says, My knowledge of shaders is they exist and involve a lot of math that I am not bad at. I haven't really had cause to learn about them in my time, but I don't think they'll pose much of a problem if they prove necessary. Any threats you may have heard me make about shader-based miasma clouds are purely threats, though I think it wouldn't actually take me as long as, say, the SDL2 upgrade, unless SDL2 itself provides a major barrier. Also, yeah, go back to version 47.05 and you'll find that there is in fact a day-night cycle that works fine. It still works fine in 51, it just doesn't change the tile graphics, and it's a pure how do we do the graphics problem right now? And you'll note it does reduce your line of sight, etc. And Tarn's additional response is, it exists, and any further display beyond shrinking vision is a graphics problem. There could also be a widget up in the top right for handling the date and time, night and weather, and tracks, and odor, etc. So you don't have to press a bunch of keys to get at those separately. Another question from the old crypt, and they say, Is new Lewis scripting for Raw's generation only? Or it's also for runtime use? Will Raw's eventually migrate to more Lua friendly format like JSON, or will it always be string connotation approach? How much of the magic system will be Lua driven, and how much is hard coded? Will old systems be rewritten to use Lua? Could we use Lua to create our own mechanics in the game? What version of Lua is it? And what brings you to make such a decision? And Tarn's lengthy response for Crip's lengthy question is, I want as much of it out there as possible. One reason I wanted Lua scripting first is so that when I get to myth generation, it can be out publicly as much as possible, instead of creating a new Forgotten Beast situation where a lot is hidden that parameters can't get at. I wanted to deal with Forgotten Beast, Vampire, and Werewolves situation itself. So this all seems nice. We've still got hard-coded magical effects at the granular level through interaction effects, and this will probably be true for a while, but magic itself 
should, over time, become more and more scripty. And the hope is that myth generation and the magic system generation are all scripts as they come in, and the Lua beta progresses. I might throw a few things in for the end of the adventure mode beta before the Lua beta begins, that use the old pre-Lua system, just because it's the only thing I have now. But that's just to get the tutorial done and the chosen ball rolling. And anything I add now-ish should be Luafied in the early stages of the Lua beta. After that, for some basic things I want to do with magic, I require a multi-step scripts that can refer back to variables and so forth. And it was just looking like I needed to make a scripting language. And that would be too much. When scripting languages exist with a history of use in games, which also solve the Forgotten Beast problem. So we arrived here, the happy world of scripts, and generating scripts using standard scripting languages. The next question comes in from Volilol, and they say, With the introduction of Lua scripting, can we anticipate other movements from hard-coded to the raws in this same swoop, such as the non-kiln workshops and other reactions? And Tarn's response is, yeah, we've already bitten off enough for this swoop, but we're hoping to get more and more out there. Whether that involves the reactification of more jobs or something else, I don't really know yet. Now this is a really big multi-parter from Rorax, so we're just going to have to do what we can with it. I will move through it as conveniently as possible. Is there any plan to revisit graphics from the world screen in fort mode and the travel screen in adventure mode? Even on the normal displays, the icons are super duper small. And I recently bought a full HD display and it's absolutely impossible to play because of how small everything is. And Tarn's response is, yeah, it's quite small. We probably need another level. I'm not sure when that'll happen though, but it's something under consideration because as you say, it's very small. Rorax's next question is, any luck making the game except TTF or OTF and other fonts? Same problem as above. The one that comes with the game is not very readable for me, as it is, but HD screens make it even more so. I would also like to state, I don't know what they mean by HD screen, but I'm presuming they're playing it on a 4K screen or something similar because HD ain't that big, but whatever. And Tarn's response is, TTF seemed troublesome for as long as we had it. I'm not sure what the obstacles are. The underlying code for displaying text is pretty much the same, so obstacles are probably the same anyway. And Rorax follows that with, Combat would really benefit from the simplest animations. Like an entire image of a unit moving in a direction of the attack, would it be possible to implement? And Tarn's response is, We've done some experiments with sliding units, out of their squares. There are some issues with it. Due to how our dirty buffer works to keep the graphics updated at an adequate speed. These can theoretically be overcome, though it's a large problem. Then we'd be able to do slidey attacking and even slidey walking. Though I'm still not sure slidey walking looks good at our movement speeds. And Rorax asks another question with, now that most things on the screen is palatable, are we any closer to seeing something resembling ray-traced light sources? Ay ay ay. One of the prettiest things in the game is magma, because of the amazing gradient it has across long distances. I assume it's depth-based, so not ray-tracing, but it sort of behaves as if it is. It would greatly help with mood and immersion to have more effects like this. And Tarn's response is, if we moved over to triangles or quads, which are theoretically supported more easily in SDL2, we'd be able to do more with shading and vortex lighting. But that's probably not a trivial move. I'm not sure how performance would be affected either way, and all palette changes are pre-baked as it stands, which doesn't work for many effects. And Rorax continues with, speaking about procedural magic, what is the gameplay value of it? Currently, I have a battle axe wielding dwarves bonking goblins on the head. How is proc gen magic going to change that? Will there be some close quarter spells like freezing hands and ranged spells like fireball, obviously? Or weapons with proc gen effects such as weakening poison, draining HP, etc. And Tarn's response is, we are considering everything. Yeah, including possibilities for dwarves, but certainly gameplay will be affected early in the development process, by critters doing horrible things to you. 
And procedural magic has the broader purpose of making worlds more interesting and varied in general. And then Rorax asks if Tarn's played Noida and says, it's pretty interesting magic wand building mechanics that interacts with the proc gen world in a very interesting way. Personally, I don't know why people keep bringing up Noida because I don't see its magic generation or the way it does magic being even remotely similar to the way Dwarf Fortress likely will do it, but people like Noida, I guess. And Tarn's response is, yeah, I've won it a few ways, though I haven't seen most of the optional content. Fun for spell editing and fun for fluids. And Rorax asks, how will the potential conflicts between the game calling Lua API and mods be resolved? Will order of mods in the mod manager influence the precedence of these changes? And Tarn's response is, regarding mod order, I assume mod order controls the conflicts and stomping. Though, I'll defer to Putnam since she built the system and used it. And Rorax asks, I know Lua is industry standard, but for the sake of friendly trolling, why not Python? How did the choice of language happen? What's your take on one based indexing in Lua? And Tarn's response is, I just know Lua works well enough in lots of games. And Putnam said she could do it in Lua. So she did. So that's good. If Python were more expedient for her, we very well could have gone that way since I don't know Lua or Python, aside from the Lua I've now studied a bit. And certainly one indexing doesn't play nice with other existing language. And there are other oddities to deal with, like the and or combos for max tyranny operators, which I just have to get used to. But on the whole, it seems to be going well. And Rorax asks, since manager functionality is by definition scripting, Will that also be exposed via Lua bindings? And Torn's response is, the interface generally is on the table, but it's a large project and we'll just see more and more come in over time. I'd be happy if the interface can be remade entirely. And finally, a question from somebody else and it's Eurist McHates Elves. And they ask, with the planned addition of things like improved sieges and the replacement of attack triggers for sieges and mega beasts, how are you planning to prevent the possible result of either being never sieged at all or being steamrolled on year one. And Tarn quotes Eric Blank, so I will read their response first. They say, these are already possibilities now, depending on embark location. And that's probably still going to be possible in the future. Say, embarking on an isolated island or mountain valley where goblins don't know your settlement exists for years, or embarking right next door to them. Simulating military and strategic decision making was a goal. And if you think of yourself playing a strategy game, and you found a new site in an area your opponent hasn't revealed or searched, and they never got around to it, that site never gets attacked until endgame. If you lose, and they're searching the entire map for stragglers, consider also, if an opponent started building a, a fortified position just ahead of where the front lines of your conflict had been, it probably becomes a priority target for you to raise it as quickly as you can manage because it gives them a position from which to stage further assaults and push the front line back further, getting the goblin AI to follow a strategic planning against a, the dwarven sieve, consider the player's fortress a part of that sieve, and accurately weigh its threat level and value as a target of attacks is probably paramount. And mega beasts might attack more at random though, excluding mega beasts living in the immediate vicinity of your fortress who might come to wreck it sooner than later. And Tarn's response is, Eric's reply covers it more or less. Unless you are on an island, never being sieged will be the result of peace, which you can disrupt. Or being far away from the potential action, which is a choice, for steamrolling. That's definitely an issue. But the default start of seven dwarves with a wagon is something that we can still reasonably simulate as not detected until they make something of themselves. If a patrol happens to cross right through your location, then that's an issue of start site selection. And that was presumably player choice. And then there's the possibility of larger starts with armies. It's up to the UI part to guesstimate for the player what their game will be like for warning purposes. Either way, I think there should be plenty of reasonable start locations that give something like the current experience in most worlds and hopefully we can find them for people. But there's certainly the possibility of a little extra surprise, and this is probably fine. Since we have a difficulty tab now, 
it would be a legit setting to have like no invasions in the first few years, please. Though, the more we can arrive at that organically, the better. Thank you very much for watching this month's video. If you'd like to see more of these, or you just want to go back through the backlog, I've been doing these now for several years. They're generally monthly, and sometimes I'm kind of late, like this one. If you'd like to see more content from me, I put up a pretty cool big video recently, and there should be a link where you can click on it on the screen right now, so uh, do it. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next one.